Well, thanks for being in worship today, wherever you're joining us from. And if you're joining us from Saratoga, what an exciting time to be in Saratoga. It's horse racing season, right? And all the world is showing up in Saratoga. We're glad you're a part of this family. And then it's always a good time to be at Half Moon. My goodness, what an amazing place that is in Latham. Are you kidding me? I mean, Latham Circle is the center of the universe. When Jesus returns... When Jesus returns, I kid you not, he's touching down in Latham Circle. That's the center of the universe. It's amazing. And if you're joining us online, um, God help you, all right? You're just, you're just missing out on all the good stuff of being together. No, we're seriously, we're happy you're joining us online, and I know God's going to have something for you as well. Well, an old man was on the brink of death, and his wife was with him to comfort him, and he began to reminisce about their life together. And he said, you know, Agnes, you've been with me through all of these hard things of life. She said, yes, I have. I've been with you through it all. He said, do you remember when I was drafted and had to go away to war and all the trauma that I went through, and you were there with me, Agnes? Yes, I was there. I remember and you remember later uh, when our house burned down and it was such a, such a traumatic thing for, for us, but you were there. She said, yes, I remember, and I was there. He said, and you remember later when we had that horrible car accident and the car was just totaled, but you were there. And she said, yes, I remember, and indeed I was there. And, and he said, Agnes, do you, do you remember when we went bankrupt and, oh, it was just so horrific and we lost everything we had and you were there. She said, yes, I remember I was there. And then the old man said, you know, it's pretty obvious when you think about it, Agnes, you're just bad luck. <laughs> well, I think it all depends on perspective, doesn't it? Now, we're going to look at a passage today as we wrap up this series called Winning Ways that it really challenges our perspective on where strength comes from. Because today, we're going to see Paul teach something that is so counterintuitive, it's hard to wrap our minds around it. So let me give you the context before we dive into the text. The context is that Paul's apostleship is being challenged. These super apostles back in Corinth are saying, ah, you don't have to listen to that apostle Paul. I mean, after all, he didn't literally walk with Jesus like the other apostles did. And so he's not a real apostle. And they started saying all these horrible things about him, and they were challenging the, you know, his teaching and and just dissing the Apostle Paul. And so, in chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Corinthians, what you see is Paul is defending his apostleship. And he, he kind of says, look, I'm going to stoop to their level. It seems that just about all these super apostles understand is bragging. That's all they get. They're into boasting, so I'm going to boast back. And so as we pick it up now in chapter 12, verse 1, Paul is kind of in the middle of what you might call a brag fest. So here we go. I must go on boasting. Although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know God knows. Now, as we go on here, it's going to become obvious that this man he's talking about who was caught up to the third heaven is actually himself. But it feels kind of weird to talk about this spectacular spiritual experience. And so in an act of humility, he, he sort of goes to third person. But make no mistake, Paul is talking about himself here. And by the way, the third heaven that he speaks of, in the Jewish mind, this is the very abode of God. 
This is where God is, okay? And so he has this spectacular, if you wanna call it this, out of body experience. And this happened when Paul had been a Christian less than 10 years. So let's read on, verse three. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Wow. You see, Paul had experience. Have you ever had an experience in life and you tried to describe it to somebody and finally you just almost gave up and said, look, it's beyond words. It's beyond words. Well, if you've had that experience, you know kind of how Paul felt. He, he couldn't even find the words to describe what God gave him an insight into. But he goes on, verse five, I'll boast about a man like that, but I'll not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. And notice now verse seven. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now think about this. One of the temptations that people have who've had these really cool, really awesome experiences with God is that there's a temptation to pride. And I hope we understand that in the Christian life, pride is a real problem. The Bible says, God mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble, Proverbs 3:34. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom, Proverbs eleven two. God detests all the proud of heart. You may be sure of this. They will not go unpunished, Proverbs 16, 5. Or the words of Nebuchadnezzar, who was so puffed up with arrogance. He said, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Get this part. And those who walk in pride, woo, he is able to humble. So when you or I have pride in our lives, listen, that is offensive to God and in Paul's case, he said to keep me from becoming that way, to keep me from becoming this arrogant, puffed up, obnoxious, ineffective Christian leader, God gave me, he allowed in my life this thorn in the flesh. And it would be a constant reminder of my reliance on God that I don't have the strength in and of myself, but I must rely on him. Now, let's camp out here for a moment. What was that thorn in the flesh? Well, I'm gonna give you some guesses on what it might be. The most popular guess among Bible scholars is that it was some sort of eyesight problem, that Paul had poor eyesight. You say, where in the world did they get that? Well, let's, let's look at it. In 2 Thessalonians, he makes this statement, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. Now, what was that distinguishing mark that Paul added to his letters? Well, we get some more insight in Galatians chapter six, where he writes, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now, here's what we believe happened. Probably, Paul didn't personally do the writing on the papyrus of most of his letters, possibly not any of them. He had scribes, or what we call an amanuensis, to do that. 
For instance, in the book of Romans, chapter 16, you read a little verse there. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. What? Paul apparently had dictated this to a guy named Tertius, and he was the actual scribe who wrote down the book of Romans. So Tertius gives a little shout out there to everybody who might read it later. And so whether the scribe was Titus or Timothy or Silvanus or Tertius or whoever it was, Paul at the end would apparently take the quill, the stylus, and he would, the belief is, his eyes were so bad, he would kind of press his eyeball to the paper almost and put his own trademark signature on that. See what large letters I write. I have to write them big so I can see them. And that's the belief of what was happening here, okay? He adds his own little howdy, it's me. Now you know this letter is really from me. It's the genuine thing. But then there's another statement to kind of add to this theory of bad eyesight that I believe is the most powerful one of all. He says to the Galatians, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Now, it's possible that he's only speaking metaphorically there. Just like we would say, ah, you would have given me the shirt off your back. It's possible that that's just an expression of speech. But unless he's speaking metaphorically and just using an idiom, uh, that's a powerful argument for the eyesight theory, okay? That he had poor eyes and he'd say, look, you guys cared for me so much Whew, if it were humanly possible, you would have ripped your own eyeballs out and given them to me. You cared for me that much. Now, some of you good Bible students are going, Pastor, solve the issue. Just look at what the Greek word is and look at other places in the New Testament where that word is used. That's a great idea. In fact, I wanna tell you the most important hermeneutical principle as you study God's word is to compare scripture with scripture. You can write that down. It is the most important principle. There are many other very important interpretation principles, hermeneutical principles that we use, but comparing scripture with scripture because we believe that all of God's word is inspired. You can't just camp out on one section and say, this represents my whole belief about this if the Bible says other things about it. You gotta look at all of them and hold them in tension and compare and contrast and one passage will give you insight to another. So why don't I just look at the Greek word for thorn? The Bible will tell you what it means. But here's where the problem is. That is the only time in the whole New Testament that the word scolops is used. The word for thorn is only used one time. And all of you Greek students will know that that's called a hopex legomena whenever you've got a Greek word that's only used one time in the entire New Testament. But this is one of those cases so it kind of hits a dead end for us, right? You say, well, how is it used in classical Greek literature of the time? Well, there, the word scolops means a sharp stake, something with a pointed end on it, like a tent peg that you would drive into the ground. And so there we are. That's all the insight we, we have. Now, the early church fathers began to weigh in on what they thought the thorn was. Tertullian said that it was a persistent earache. Um, Jerome, the Latin scholar, said that it was headaches. Chrysostom, a powerful proclaimer of truth in the early church, said that he thought it was migraines. And there've been all kinds of theories. Everything from epilepsy to gout to spastic colon condition, sexual temptation because Paul was single. Uh, Martin Luther thought it was a tendency to doubt and depression. I think Luther was just looking at Paul through his own experience because he was always tempted to doubt and depression. Some thought it was a speech impediment because after all, the Corinthians had said this about Paul. They said, ooh, you know that Paul, his letters, ooh, they're weighty and forceful. But in person, He's unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. By the way, I know some people like that today. Have you ever seen this? Somebody could get behind a computer screen and write a bold, forceful email, 
and they sound like a giant. But in person, they're a wimp. Have you ever... Have you ever noticed this? This is a common reality in our day. And that's what they were accusing Paul of in his day. And he admitted he wasn't the most eloquent guy on the team, all right? And so the theories just go on and on and on. Some people think it was malaria because on his missionary journeys, Paul would have been bitten mercilessly by mosquitoes. Some deep theologians, and I kind of like this theory, they, some deep, deep theologians, believe it was his ex-mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And say, I thought he was single. Well, he was, but the theory is most Pharisees were married. Maybe he was married earlier. Maybe his wife passed away. We don't know, but... There's all these ideas. And then some people get real spiritual and say, well, he called it a messenger of Satan. Surely that means it was a satanic attack. Maybe it was like Job, you know, God gave jo uh, Satan permission to attack Job and it, it led to all kinds of pain in Job's life. It could be, could be that. I don't think so because... Uh, I think messenger of Satan is just an expression of speech. Like we would say, my back hurts like the devil or uh, the devil is in the details. You don't mean that literally, do you? When you say the devil is in the details, no. It's an expression. What we mean is some things sound good in theory, but when you try to apply them to real life situations, they kind of break down. It's really hard to apply. So the devil is in the details. That's what we mean by that. And I think messenger of Satan is kind of like that. It's just an expression of speech, okay? So we could go on and on and on about what the thorn means. This is one of those occasions when I hope we're comfortable just not knowing. Just not knowing. I hope you're okay with that. There are some things in the Bible that we just aren't gonna know in a slam dunk, absolute way until we see Jesus face to face, okay? And this is one of those areas. But what we do know about it is this. He goes on to say, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. God, this stinks. Why am I going through this? Take this away away. That's what I would have prayed, wouldn't you? God, terminate this. Get this out of my life. I hate this. I don't want to have to deal with this cup of affliction anymore. But God said no. And this wasn't just a little splinter like in your finger. This is a thorn. I mean, this is a big issue. Now, why am I stressing this? Because in just a few moments, and trust me, we will get to the application in just a few moments, I want you to be thinking about yourself. Because this is my experience as a pastor. Most Christ followers I know have some kind of thorn in their life. It's a painful situation, and you've asked God over and over to take it away, and up until now, he's basically said no. It could be something related to your children. It might be a physical situation that is that thorn for you. It might be relational, like with your family. It might be, uh, you know, some sort of emotional pain that you have in your life that you just, it just, you've tried what you know to do. It just doesn't seem to be going away. It might have to do with career and your aspirations and your goals. Most Christians I know have some kind of thorn that they're grappling with. It's been with them for a long time, created a lot of pain, and they've asked God repeatedly but here's the answer that they've gotten, just like Paul. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? God said to Paul, no, I'm not gonna take it away, but I'm gonna walk with you through it. 
No, I'm not gonna remove this right now, but I am going to empower you to navigate through this situation, and I've got my reasons for that. And here's one of the reasons as we read on. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. Now that, my friends, is one of the most profound statements in all the Bible. Listen, listen, if you've got an actual Bible open right now, wherever you are, if you've got an actual physical Bible open, I want you to mark that verse. Would you please just take a marker, mark that. If you don't have anything to write with or mark with, prick your finger right now, please, and bleed, bleed. <laughs> bleed on that passage to make sure it shows up. By the way, I love it when people come with an actual physical Bible. I don't always have one. And through the week, I look on my phone a lot at scripture there, but I love to study the Bible with an actual physical Bible. Here's why. Listen, nobody ever asked for granny's old cell phone that she used to read scripture on. Nobody but they do cherish grandma's Bible that she wrote notes in and where the pages are kind of, you know, tattered from her reading so faithfully in that Bible. That is a priceless piece of memorabilia right there. So I love it when people just kind of have an actual Bible, even today, that they pull out and work from, okay? Okay. So Paul goes on he, here and he says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. In other words, if this is what it takes to have God's power in my life, woo, bring it on. Bring it on. You better believe I'm okay with that because I want God to get glory through my life. And then finally, in verse 10, he says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I don't know about you, but I want to go, Paul, are you for real? Come on. You actually, no, no, no. Are you, are you being straight with me? Are you being serious? You actually delight in these things? Insults, weakness, hardship? You delight in them? Paul would go, yeah. Because when you learn the paradoxical truth that God's strength shows up best through human weakness, you are ready to rejoice and delight in those things because you realize, finally, that when I'm weak, totally relying on God, in over my head, that's when God's power is the most likely to really show up. Now, we've walked through the passage, and I quickly, with the minutes we have remaining, want to highlight three principles that I think we can draw as life lessons. These pass the road test of life, friends. Three lessons we can draw straight from this passage. Lesson number one, God's empowering presence often shines best through human weakness. Now, I'm about to ask you a question where I want you to raise your hand, and I promise you it's not a trick question. Don't you hate it when speakers trick you and they get you to raise your hand on something and then they shame you? Wrong answer. No, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. This is not a right or wrong answer. I simply wanna know honestly by a show of hands, and my hand is already up. Here's the question. How many of you, Christ followers, would love to see more evidence of God's empowering presence in your life day by day. Could I see your hand, please? Just honestly, if it's not true, don't raise your hand. Whoa, thank you. That's, that's almost 100%. You'd like to see more evidence. Now, what if I added this caveat? And you can see it, but you gotta go through some really painful stuff for it to show up. Ooh, now don't raise your hand right now. Don't raise your hand but I wonder if you would put your hand up for that one. I'm not so sure I'd raise my hand for that. But that's what Paul is talking about here. God's empowering presence shows up best when we're going through some really difficult stuff. 
author Bob Benson wrote a really cool book called See You at the House. And he shares a conversation he had with a friend of his named W.T. And W.T. had a heart attack, but he hadn't seen his friend for a while. And when he saw him after the heart attack, he said, W.T., how'd you like your heart attack? I said, how do I like my heart attack? Are you kidding? What do you mean? He said, it nearly killed me. It scared me to death. He said, well, would you like to do it again? He said, do it again? No, I hated it. He said, well, would you recommend it? Would you recommend it for others? He said, man, are you kidding me? And then Benson asked him, look, since your heart attack, does your life mean more to you now than it did before? W.T. said, well, yeah, yeah. And you and Nell, you've always had a beautiful marriage, but are you closer now than you ever were before? Well, sure. How about your new granddaughter? W.T. said, I sure do hold her a bit tighter now. He said, do you have a new compassion for people, a deeper understanding, more sympathy, more patience? He said, I sure do. Bob Benson paused and he said, W.T., how'd you like your heart attack? Silence was the answer. And then Benson writes, now, neither I nor W.T. would tell you to rush right out and have a heart attack, but there's good majesty in the process. Brothers and sisters, God has goals for us. He has a mission for us. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. It's often through some pretty painful stuff in our lives that he prepares us for what he wants to do in and through our lives. Second principle. Second principle. Our trust in God through difficult situations releases his power in our lives. It releases his power. Now, I want you to think about some of the biblical situations that you're aware of where God did some awesome things. Think about with Abraham and Sarah, how that they had a child even beyond childbearing years. And it was the faith they had in Almighty God that released his power in their lives. Or think about Moses, where he's pressed between the Egyptian army bearing down on him and the waters of the Red Sea. And it was his faith in the delivering God, God Almighty, that opened that Red Sea up and they marched through safely. Or think about David, the shepherd boy, who took five smooth stones and a slingshot and battled a giant and won the victory. Or think about Simon Peter, who gets out on a stormy sea, out of the boat, and takes a stroll on the sea with Jesus. Now, what do all these situations and many others that we could name, what do they all have in common? These were all impossible situations. Humanly speaking, there's no way that they could have done this. It was way beyond them. But when they trusted in God and still held on to their faith in God, God did amazing things and his power was demonstrated. I'll never forget being in Buffalo, New York um, years ago. And I was with one of my mentors. I've had a number of incredible mentors in my life. And one of them, as I've shared before, was a guy named Charlie Riggs. And, and Charlie was a gnarly old veteran with the Billy Graham team. He had been with Billy Graham for decades. He spent over 50 years of his life, actually, uh, before he finally retired, working with Billy Graham and with the team. He was the director of counseling and follow-up. Just a great man. Grew up in Olean, New York. And God used Charlie to train more people to share their faith in Jesus than anyone else who's ever lived. And I can say that without flinching because of the platform that Charlie had. Because with the team, all over the world, he was able to train tens of thousands of Christians every year to share their faith in Jesus Christ. What a guy. And I was so honored and so blessed to have him as a mentor in in my life. Charlie and I had just 
been over at the arena in downtown Buffalo getting some things ready because later that day we were going to brief a final briefing just before the crusade meeting started with the five or 6,000 counselors who'd been trained to work at the crusade. And we walked back to the hotel and there in the lobby was Billy Graham. And of course, Charlie and Billy knew each other very well. They'd been around the world together, worked together for decades, even at that point. And Charlie introduced me and I'd met Billy several times, but I didn't know if he knew me or not. And Billy said, would you guys like to have lunch? And so we joined him for lunch and I watched these two veterans of the faith as they talked and interacted with each other and I asked them questions and I listened. Just amazing. And later that day, later that day, I said to Charlie, what's the key? What's the key to people like Billy Graham and People like yourself, where God has done such awesome things. And here's what, here's what Charlie said. He said, Rex, the key to my life is I've always been in over my head. I said, Charlie, what do you mean in over your head? He said, well, I know I'm not highly educated. I know I'm not the most articulate guy. I, I, I don't have these amazing, spectacular gifts. And yet, and yet, somehow, God has used me because I always find myself in situations where I know I'm not adequate. I know it. And it causes me to rely on God all the more. And he comes through. And he does things that amaze me. Friend, I wanna tell you this right now. Just a, just a wake-up call. Whether you've been in Christ for 40 years or four days. Listen, if you think you can live this life on your own, you need to be broken. I say it gently, but I say it firmly. You need to be broken because we all need to come to a place of brokenness where we realize I am not adequate, but he is. He can do through me what he desires to do. And here's the final principle I wanna share with you today. The way we represent Jesus through the painful experiences is often our most powerful witness. Please note that. The way we represent Jesus through these painful things, the thorn in your life, is often our most powerful witness. Now, one of the privileges of my life is God has given me a front row seat back when I was younger, the Graham team, as well as as a pastor, to see literally thousands and thousands of lives changed by the power and grace of God. What a privilege that is. And I've made some conclusions about that. I've never read these in a book. I don't have a stack of statistical data to back up what I'm about to say, but I've concluded that almost everybody, there are a few outliers, I'll admit, where all three of these things were not happening, okay? But the I'll, I'll, I'll dare say 98, 99% of people who come to Jesus Christ have these three things happening. Number one, somebody prayed for them by name. Somebody prayed for them by name. Cared enough to write their name down and intercede for that person that God would open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and save that person they, pray, they were prayed for. Number two, they knew at least one Christian that they respected. Hopefully more, but at least one Christian that they really respected. And number three, they heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Trust me on this. People who come to faith in Jesus, those three things are going on at least. They've been prayed for by name, at least one Christian they respect, and they hear a clear presentation of the gospel. But let me, let me just probe a little bit further in our final moments here. When you dig a little deeper, here's what you'll find. That one Christian they respect, guess what? They've watched that Christian. They've watched him or her go through some really difficult stuff. And they were curious to know how that Christian would respond. And what they saw is a person who went through the worst things life can dish out and they navigated it with grace and held on to their faith in God. And they made a conclusion. Whatever power, whatever God got them through that, I need to know that God. And it made them hungry to know 
the living God. And as I close today, I just want to say this. Man, I am so proud of this congregation. I respect so much the men and women that I know in this congregation. Here's why I say that. Because I've watched you navigate some of the most painful things that life can dish out. And by God's grace, you're still here. I've watched some of you lose a spouse that you dearly loved. I've watched some of you lose children. I, I, I can't fathom the grief of those kinds of losses. I've watched some of you lose a business, just went belly up and your life was devastated. I know the stories of so many of you. Some of you have experienced horrible sexual abuse that shattered you. Some of you have had Christian leaders let you down and it left you disillusioned and desolate, wondering if you could even hang on to your faith. I've watched you. I've watched you go through these things in life. I've, I've seen you go through betrayal by friends and physical problems and disease and hardship and difficulties. And I've watched you. Guess what? You're still standing. You're still standing. Praise be to God. And the devil is not going to take you out. And God's power is showing up through you through these most difficult situations because that's when our witness for Christ shines brightest. Praise be to God. So here's the bottom line. Do you have a thorn in your life? Something causing a lot of pain. And up until now, at least, up until now, at least, God has said, look, I'm not gonna take it away, but I'm gonna walk with you through that. Why does God do that? Because he's a mean, awful God? No. Because the one who loved you enough to die for you on the cross still loves you enough to not quit working in your life until his full design for you. All he intended in you and through you finally is brought to completion. Praise be to God. Man, he's not going to give up on you. Father, thank you for your relentless love that chases after us and pursues us and goes with us to the deepest pits of life that we find ourselves in, the darkest places, the most awful devastation. You are there. And I thank you for this paradoxical truth your apostle Paul has given us today that when we are weak, whoa, look out. When we're weak, that's, that's when we're really strong because we realize it's all from you. So Father, help those who are dealing with the thorn to hang on, to hang on, because your purpose is perfect and you will not relent and give up until all that you've designed for us is fully completed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.